Welcome to The Mental Balance. The Mental Balance is going to be a platform that aims to bring balance to our minds. Welcome everyone to our Tech Minds Unwind series. My name is Vidhi Rawal and I work in tech in the Silicon Valley. In this episode, we'll be joined by Dr. Elena Herrera. Hey Elena, I'm so glad to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so how about we just kick it off with a little bit about your background so far? Sure. So I'm a psychologist located here in San Jose. I'm also licensed in the state of Oregon. I've been practicing for almost 20 years now. Currently, I'm in private practice in San Jose, and I primarily work with couples and adults focused on relationships, anxiety, depression, and uh, it, you know, in, in my spare time, I like to you know, be with my dogs, with my family, my husband, and and we've been camping a lot lately. So that's what I've been into. <laughs> nice, perfect things to do for summer. Yeah. Uh huh. Awesome. So then, if we had to quantify the number of tech people that you've seen so far, or you see currently in your practice, what would the ratio look like? Hmm. Well, since I started working with couples, I think that ratio has maybe reduced. I, I think when I first started my private practice, it felt like it was over 50%. Wow. And part of that was because I intentionally sought out working with those individuals because one thing I didn't mention in kind of about me is that I've also worked at universities and their college counseling centers. And in those roles, I worked a lot with undergraduate and graduate students, specifically in engineering and tech. Mm -hmm. And so when I was starting my own practice, I decided that this was a population I really wanted to work with, and in particular with men. So in the beginning, it was, yes, almost 100%. And now I would say I probably see two or three individual adult clients in tech per week mm -hmm. and that can vary so it's probably now maybe 30 percent or so of the clients I work with okay but historically like yeah. you mentioned you've seen a lot of uh, engineers in training and a lot of tech people in mm -hmm. training and now after that through your practice also it's been like 50 percent and now to 30 percent so it's been a varying proportion of folks yeah i would say so mm -hmm. and what drew you to talking and like wanting to always focus on men in engineering or men in tech particularly it was kind of by accident you know the, the job that i took it's been almost 10 years now but i was working at uc davis and unfortunately at that time the university had experienced a number of suicides and many of them had in students in engineering and so they decided they needed to support those students and so they hired me to work in their department specifically with those students and working with them, I, I just fell in love with them. I worked with the undergraduate and graduate students. I worked with some of the faculty as well and did a lot of trainings and consultations. And there were mostly male students. I did have a lot of female students and they had very specific issues related to being women and, and their gender and, and, and all of that. But I just loved how their brains worked. And then I felt really comfortable. And then I don't know if it was a coincidence or not, but my husband is an engineer and so <laughs> and working with him and learning about about what he does and giving me sort of the inside scoop and, and knowing what his needs were, I, I thought, you know, I'm here in Silicon Valley and I'm gonna get a lot of people in tech anyway, but I really like working with those individuals and in particular men, I felt like they had a specific need and they were very underserved. Mm -hmm it just felt like a natural fit for me and I thought there would be no shortage of, of clients and I just really enjoy working with them. You fell in love literally with the... Yes, <laughs> I did. Yeah, with the engineer. Yeah, but that's, uh -huh. that's awesome. I'm glad that you're there to help uh, the underrepresented men and how difficult it is for them to speak up and deal with their mental health troubles or anything that they're going through. So, since you're based in the heart of Silicon Valley, would you also say that you already said that you see 30 or 40 percent of techies? What are the other kind of folks that you see around here? You know, I work with a lot of women and some of them happen to be in tech, but some of them are just in, in other industries. So I work with a lot of women who perhaps 
are feeling more burnt out, mm -hmm. you know, have some family issues. I also work with a lot of other therapists. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of a therapist for other therapists and I really enjoy that as well. Yeah. But you know, this is a very stressful area of the country to live in. So people dealing with just the everyday life, but also people who've suffered from childhood trauma and depression. And, and I see that, of course, showing up in, in the couples that I work with, too, and how that affects their adulthood, but then how it affects how they show up in their relationships. So I have a pretty varied caseload, I would say, very unique and interesting. It's never boring. And I, I feel lucky that I really enjoy the people that I work with. I like them as people. So that's a real nice perk. Nice. That's amazing. So then is your area of expertise now dealing with people in tech and any specific things that you deal with, like trauma, grief, or anything in particular? Yes. You know, there are specific concerns that people in tech have, you know, the high stress and the turnaround, of course, lately, as I'm sure you're aware of all the, the layoffs that have been happening in the major companies. So you know, naturally that's something that comes up, but just the human life, of course, you know, people have some really difficult stories. So trauma, of course, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's health concerns, financial concerns, you know, and some of these people may or may not be in relationships, but that's also an issue that they have. If they're in relationships, how do they make it better? If they're not, how do I get into one? It's just very, I'd say varied in what I see. Got it. Okay. So basically you deal with a lot of, a range of emotions and situations and yeah, the expertise goes wide. That's amazing. So how about we jump in further into the real problem of techies and their mental health? So what would you say are some common patterns that you see in the one-on-one -on -one conversations and situations that you have with men or women or otherwise? Lately, there's been just a lot of unpredictability mm -hmm. with, am I be laid off and all that? And that's just so scary. These people have mortgages and rent to pay for and, and, and worried about what that is going to look like. Are they going to be the next to be let go? It's just so volatile lately. But, you know, not to generalize, but typically, you know, if that wasn't happening, I would see other patterns that you know, these are very high stress environments to work for. You know, you might have some of the companies that value mental health and really check in with their employees, but I, I would say that the vast majority of the clients I've worked with have bosses who just don't care and expect them to work, you know, an, an insane amount of hours. So this heightened pressure for productivity and efficiency and, and getting it right. And so sometimes I don't see a lot of opportunities for them just to kind of slow down. I had one person who didn't even realize that what he was going through was anxiety. He was talking about heart racing so much all the time, clenching his jaw and having headaches and, and not realizing that he was going through the day with his mouth clenched because he was so, so stressed and he had a you know, terrible boss to work for that was just kind of constantly hovering over him. And again, that's that doesn't always have to be the norm, but I've heard enough of those stories. A lot of the engineers I work with are, are working on very expensive products, you know, millions of dollars worth of products that they are building and engineering that they might be managing, and they have to get it absolutely perfect. And I understand that. If you get one little thing, and I'm not an engineer by any means, so I don't want to speak, but one little tiny step wrong, you have to find what that is. And these is, this is what they work with every single day and not a lot of focus on how are you doing? There's, there's less and less of those conversations among their, their colleagues, I would say. Yeah, no, that's, that's very, very true. Techies have to be more and more efficient, producing more and more workers instead of 40, there's 80. Would there be some other way that these patterns affect them internally that they can observe or realize that they're going through? You gave a great example of the anxiety that someone was experiencing and they didn't even realize. Would there be anything else? You know, and I see this sometimes with my own relationship and with my husband, you know, trying to figure out, is this the most efficient use of time? Mm. <laughs> yeah. 
I get that. I, I, I understand it. And I understand that sometimes we have certain rules that we need to abide by. But what that means, though, is that we can't treat everything as, as a problem or we can't treat everything that has a maybe a solution that we can necessarily fix. So mm-hmm. I often see, you know, especially with the men that I work with and not that this can't happen with the women as well, but I've seen it enough is that when there's a problem, let's say, with a, a relationship, a romantic relationship, immediately they kind of jump into it. I'm going to solve this problem. Mm-hmm. In any other part of their life, especially at work, they have to go in and they're very good at solving problems. And if you try and say that to your partner who maybe is not ready for that or maybe there isn't a very obvious solution, you can't approach anything like an equation. So sometimes there's a difficulty of trying to be a little bit more flexible or not approaching in that in that kind of way. That can cause a little bit of difficulty, I would say. Yeah, no, that that's true. We kind of want to fix all the problems that we see, even though they might not be problems and we just have to feel through them. The concept of feeling yeah. is probably not that prevalent, I guess. It's hard, you know, when you haven't been taught and, and it's no coincidence that, you know, I'm not good at math, I'm not good at science. So I didn't go into those fields. I went into psychology. Mm-hmm. Same with people who go into, you know, science or in STEM and all that because that's what they're familiar and feel safe. And so the concept, yes, of what are my feelings and what do you mean talking about them? That's how is that going to solve anything? We're asking people to do something that doesn't feel comfortable or they don't know how to do. And so that's fair. It's fair that they don't want to do that or it's it feels strange or, or maybe unproductive. Yeah. Anything in particular that you notice for females who are in tech or maybe they are a part of these industries, but they are not particularly engineers. Maybe they take on, they have some other roles like in sales or UX or anything else that you've noticed. I think that what I've seen with um, some of the women that I've worked with is they can be often outnumbered. Now, maybe it might not be such a problem that they feel uncomfortable with, but you know, in particular, I work with a lot of women who are not born in this country. They're immigrants. And so to sort of adapt to Western culture of being very vocal and, and you know, speaking up for themselves or kind of mentioning all of their accolades mm-hmm. can feel extremely, yeah, really uncomfortable. I had one woman who's saying, like, I'm not used to doing that. So what happened was she felt so uncomfortable speaking up. It's not that she didn't know what she was doing. She was very good, but she had convinced herself that there was something wrong with her because she couldn't think very quickly. Me, she wasn't me, used to that. Me. Right. But she was so intelligent. She knew exactly what she was doing. It's when she got away from the crowd, she was like, oh, I I know what I'm doing. But you put her in that type of situation and she would freeze. And so she would feel very much like she was incompetent. Not that it can't happen with men, but I often see with women is they get stuck in these groups where they're outnumbered and then you add culture and lack of familiarity and used to being quiet that they can be perceived as not knowing what they're doing and treat it as such and then they begin to believe it and that can be incredibly isolating and it can make them just feel absolutely terrible about themselves and they can burn out yeah literally story of my life everything that you said in the past few statements and not only me a lot of my female friends who are also immigrants from different countries honestly i feel like this is a story of every female immigrant in the in the tech industry that i know of so far yeah yeah is there anything you want to highlight further or then i'll move on to the next question i think we can move on to the next question okay, if you want cool so let's discuss the main point of couples and relationships that i know that you see a lot of couples in the bay area so and that is sort of your another area of expertise too and you spend most of your time on so what sort of insights would you have for the couples that you see and especially if you see couples outside of the tech industry, is there any difference between the two whatsoever? Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of the struggles that you see individuals have, it's pretty much going to be the same thing in, in couples, only you just now have two of them presenting that, you know, struggling with finances. You know, lately, unfortunately, I've seen where one person in the relationship has lost their job, you know, like the Google employee and the Apple employee, things like that. So that, of course, is going to bring a lot of stress into a relationship. 
but you know the problems that I see in couples tend to be very universal with just maybe an added touch of we're in the Silicon Valley and it's very competitive and it can be very cutthroat and it's very expensive and what that does to relationship finances and money are already one of the number one struggles that you see couples with and anyway and then you bring this area into it and of course that's going to multiply but you know some of the patterns of course the finances you see there are you know how do we even talk to each other without getting defensive you know people I've been hearing a lot lately just this week in fact I think three couples have said we can't even finish a conversation without it leading into an argument mm -hmm. and it's the same conversation over and over and over again and that's very common in relationships where they keep having the same argument over time mm -hmm. and it just gets worse and worse and worse they can't even speak to each other they can't they they're making assumptions about the other person getting very defensive and angry and so that's kind of where I come in is just helping them to have these very difficult conversations and helping them to see the other person more clearly because once we can get them less tense and not so defended you can actually listen a little bit better and hear things that you never would have heard before and that can change how they see their partner and make them you know just easier to to just sort of be with yeah that that sort of surprises me because like especially the conversation about finance since we are probably in silicon valley which is making the most money compared to everywhere in the world so it's surprising that couples still struggle about finances since both of them, I assume, are making good enough money. W would that be the right conjecture here? Yeah, you know, it can be, but sometimes you might have one of them in tech and one of them is not. Mm. You know, they have children. And again, I work with a lot of couples who were not born here, so they might send money to family members in a different country or they might be caring. Also, there's the pressure sort of lifestyle. They have children. You know, there's this pressure to have their children keep up with the other kids and go on the vacation. So while they do have a you know certain amount of privilege than other people living in a different part of the country, there's just a lot more that they need to buy. You know, and then yeah. you know, and then if you think about if they're in their individual therapy and then they're in couples therapy, and it, it adds up. So yeah, no, now I yeah. see. I see for what you mean basically like culturally support whatever they need to back home and then also live up to the lifestyle here and all of that is still very expensive because we are also in the most expensive place of sorts in the top 10 at least in the world so yeah makes sense how about something else that you've noticed in couples in tech you know and one of the the, the aspects that i see you know part of it is just generally with couples the you know, couples often come in saying, we don't know how to communicate with each other. And that's very, very prevalent. And that's a common concern that I hear about. But when you have a couple where one or both of them are in tech and sort of used to that problem solving efficiency kind of mindset, they are even maybe feel more overwhelmed by what are we supposed to do here? And how do we even solve this? We can't solve it. We're solvers. This is our identity. And we don't know what we're doing. I often, too, get couples that are very concerned about how is this going to be effective for me? I have a colleague who works in another state, and she works almost 100% with couples. And I told her, I said, you know, I get a lot of the couples who, on the first phone call with me to check in and ask if I'm available is what is the model of therapy that you use and what's the research to support <laughs> that this is effective and she's been working with couples for longer than I have and she's way she's very very advanced in fact I get consultation from her and she works in a different part of the country and she said she never gets those kinds of questions <laughs> and so she's gonna <laughs> right and so she's gonna start seeing people in California and so she said I better get prepared I said yes you should, you better get your little script out and of course she's very talented and she has no problem working with them but couples you know in tech that I see they want to make sure that the talking which is not something that they maybe have equated with being very efficient or a way to solve problems like 
how is this supposed to help them? How really? How is talking like? Uh, it's and it's not about being rude or anything. It's just they have questions, they have doubts. So there's a lot more of that kind of beginning phase of having to educate them and you know just spending time with them, helping them feel comfortable with me and what we're going to do here versus maybe a couple that is not in tech. It's a little bit less of a concern for them yeah, per see. se. Basically, people in tech want to know how this is going to be quote unquote beneficial to them and what are the strate- proven scientific strategies to actually put their time in this effort altogether. Sounds like yes. typical Bay Area <laughs> folks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. So then how do you explain that to them? I, I guess a lot of your time, as you mentioned, I imagine is to convince them that this is for their good and make them understand that they need to listen and they need to be prepared. How does that go for you? And what do you usually, what is your script like? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that I, I, I do with all my couples is that, is I just acknowledge that you have a right to want to know if this is going to work. This is your relationship we're talking about. So if you're going to invest time and money and effort and do something that you are not at all comfortable with or familiar with or think that you even know how to do, yes, you're going to be worried and because there's a lot at stake. So first thing is I just kind of just acknowledge, yeah, this is really hard. I, I understand that, that, that this is something that you want to know about. And, you know, I'm married to an engineer, so I, I know the pressures. I, I, I know kind of ways of talking and uh, to people. And so, and I say, I work with a lot of couples that are in tech and engineering. So I'm very familiar with the concerns that you might be having. This is the model that I use. Yes, while there are different models that help you, give you skills immediately, You know, unfortunately, what has shown in the research, and this is true, is that if you go and talk to that same couple a few years down the line, they have not maintained those skills that they learned. So while there might be very initial early on wins, which is very, very enticing for couples when they start implementing something and feel better in their relationship, that's great, but it doesn't last. And the model of therapy that I use that I've been trained in is you can work with the couple and meet with them years down the line and they will say we are satisfied we have higher rates of satisfied we feel bonded we feel close and that's why I think sometimes people might feel a little bit wary of this is because it is intense and it is a lot of work and it's supposed to be because I'm not just trying to throw strategies that aren't going to work that guess what, when you're in a fight, you're not going to remember to say any of that stuff. You're going to go right back to your old patterns. This is meant to help your relationship from the bottom up. And so it's going to take a little bit of time, but it's worth it. And so that's kind of my script, maybe a little bit shorter. And if they want to have a link to a study or, you know, to a website that kind of explains it, I'm happy to do that. I, I tell them, you could look it up or here you go. I can show that to you if they need a little bit more time. Got it. Okay. I see. So that's the actual procedure. That's your sales pitch. <laughs> nice. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah but that, that's awesome. So then how do you actually get them on the same page with the, you, you said that you've studied a model which allows them to not learn skills, but to get to the same page and then continue that through life. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's it's not an easy process. Every couple comes in a different phase, you know, obviously the couple that's been married for 30 years and have been unhappy for 25 of those, they're going to need a lot more time. But, you know, the couples that have you know, milder levels of distress, then they're going to see more wins and, and more progress earlier on. And so those are the ones that are going to be, of course, you know, I don't want to say easy, but just they're going to stick with it because they're going to feel a little bit better early on and, and that's going to motivate them. But the beginning phase is really my assessment period. And and I say that to them is first, I have to know what's happening between the two of you. I need to know your very ugly, ugly moments. I need to know what it looks like when you fight, what happens to you, how you interact, uh, what is it that you two are fighting about in particular? How does that look? How do things get so bad? So I spend a lot of time on assessment. 
and because and I have to explain to them that if I don't know what's happening I'm not gonna know how to help you so first I need to know what's happening let me get a lay of, of the land and then your world so that I can jump in when I need to and help you figure things out and then I need to tell you and show you what's happening so I my understanding of their relationship then I have to explain and help them understand it and see it and then that's when the work can begin but that can take quite a bit of time depending on how stressed out this relationship is is just trying to assess and figure out what's happening between these two got it and after that the work to begin is basically listening to each other and then seeing which who is displaying what patterns and then helping them come together on the same page yeah 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 you know it helps them so that then when they get home they can spot oh we're doing that thing again when we're stressed when i'm stressed out i start attacking you i start blaming you or when i'm stressed out i withdraw from you and hide out which then makes my partner very angry at me and makes them pound on my door to come and find me and then that's where it escalates so it helps them to say oh i feel myself wanting to get away from you right now but I'm not going to do that because I've learned that that makes you feel unhappy and that's where we fight. So I'm going to stay here with you. And that's the goal is to help them discover for themselves at home what's happening. They can identify it and they can change their pattern on their own. And, and then where they don't need me anymore because that's why they're in therapy is because they can't do those things on their own right now. Yeah. 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 Got it. Okay. And would you say that you see a lot of young couples come in or would it be more of those that have that are older and have had a marriage or not even a marriage or have been together for a very long time? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think about the couples that I see right now. You know, they're all in their mid to late 30s, early 40s right now, you know, and some of them have been together, either married or not, for as long as you know, 15 years, or I have a couple right now, they've been two couples, actually, now that I think about it, two couples have been together less than a year. So, you know, that's going to be very different too. a couple is in a way trying to get to know each other, still don't have like this, a lot of history, but already experiencing some challenges. Yeah, got it. Okay. And what would be the point you say that a couple needs to come to therapy? Like I usually notice a lot of resistance, at least culturally or even around here in tech. Like I think people my age are pretty open where they're like, oh yeah, we started couples therapy. Even they just started dating someone and they're serious and they start doing therapy. But for the older folks, I feel like this, there's still resistance. So what would be the point where you would ask folks to be like, okay, it's time to come to therapy because this is where it's landed. Yeah. Well, you know, definitely if you are like the couples that I saw this week who said we can't even get through a conversation without it turning into a fight, that's a red flag, right? If you're having the same constant argument and it's not getting any better and you find yourself feeling frustrated over and over, especially if it's a, you know, a hot ticket item like um how do we parent? How do we get on the same page with with parenting or or it's, you know, it could be even, you know, sex life. That's a very frequent issue that I hear, not even my couples, but my individual clients talking about that, that they're struggling with. So whenever you see repetition, that they're repeating and repeating and it's not getting anywhere, that's a pretty good sign that you need some help. You, it's not getting any better, you know, and whenever there's the possibility of infidelity if some if one of them is thinking about that if you're considering installing a dating app on your phone that's probably a sign that you're not satisfied in your relationship and you either get need to come to therapy and talk about it on your own or you and your partner um, and of course if there is infidelity there's there's a betrayal of trust and people can get through it on their own but I, I think it's much more helpful if they can do it with the support of a therapist got it okay let's talk more about the point that you mentioned about how couples you've heard a lot here couples talk about sexual issues or even in their one-on-one is it because they don't have the time the bandwidth because both of them are super busy super stressed 
or what what would you have to say more about on that you know, I think at least what I've seen with some of the couples, it, you know, when they have young children, they are very, very tired, very, very tired. I have one couple right now. They're very, they're brand new to me. I only saw them a couple of days ago and they had two children within the span of uh, a year and a half. No, actually about two years. And so they're exhausted. And so they're not intimate with each other. And what happens is, yes, you know, that's a very valid reason. If you're too exhausted, if you're not sleeping through the night, that makes sense. But they've also acknowledged, well, and then there's times we just don't even really make an effort. When they could spend time with each other, they're just like, eh, you know. So I, I see kind of maybe it starts off with a very valid, you know, fatigue and exhaustion. And then over time, it just sort of becomes a habit. They get more distant over time. And before you know it, it's been years since you've had sex or you're not even kissing or cuddling with each other. And it just feels like not even worth the effort to try anymore. Got yeah. It. Okay. And do you think that's more of a couples in tech thing? particularly or I, I mean I think that's a very common just in couples overall but at least with the couples that I've been working with because they they happen to be in tech they're working very very long hours and there's no shortage it's not like they can you know to have the traditional eight to five nine to five job they don't have that they work is always available to them and I think they know that and so there's this constant thought of well, it's nine o'clock at night, the kids are down, I can go on my computer, work a few hours. Well, yeah, they could go, you know, watch a movie or watch Netflix with their partner. But if there's a disconnect, work becomes more of an outlet for them. It could be a cause or it could be a contributing factor. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds like a Bay Area thing because of the number of hours people have to put in here. I see. Yeah. What, what would be some strategies that you would give advice to folks that listen in here? Because this is targeted to like Tech Minds Unwind. What would be some strategies or tools that you would want to give to couples in tech? Yeah, well, you know, first, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it. If, if I've said anything in this podcast that resonates with you, Maybe that's a sign. <laughs> Maybe that's, you know, you can recognize that. And so, so don't ignore it. And I, and I understand that if, if some of these issues are things that have never been spoken out loud, that can be very intimidating. How do you just all of a sudden bring this up? But I think the more that we make it part of our normal lives to just talk about things and mention, I'm feeling this way, or when's the last time that, you know, my spouse and I sat together alone and watched a movie together or when's the last time we hugged when's the last time we held hands or shared about our days when's the last time we didn't argue with each other the more we talk about it and recognize it and just acknowledge it and saying it out loud the more real it is and so don't ignore it that that's not going to make it better work is always going to be there but that's not going to be the solution to this problem it's a coping strategy and it's a distraction, but ultimately it's not going to help you in your relationship. And we are relationship beings no matter what. And we need these people in our lives and we run the risk of losing it if we go to work as our, as our way of kind of dealing with things. And as much as possible, you know, as cliche and, and, and simple as it sounds, but we need a life outside of work, whatever that is. You know, my husband is just a happier, healthier person when he gets to exercise, when he gets to do things with other people, even besides with me. He's very, very focused. And I know that with my clients that the less opportunity they have to interact with others, to whatever that is, exercise, gaming, I, you know, I don't care what it is, but if, if there's nothing in your life that is an outlet that is not work related, you're going to suffer. You need to take care of yourself somehow. And so that can't be, you know, undermined. And get a babysitter every now and then. Seriously, be an adult. Go spend time with your partner. It's not going to solve everything, but you need to do that sometimes. We, we definitely need to do that. Yeah. Oh, those are amazing. I, oh, good. I'm... I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are awesome. I feel like I have a question for the first one where you said that 
you need to feel and take in the time but folks in the bay area are busy and feeling is hard so what would be the one strategy you would provide for helping someone feel what they're really feeling yeah yeah you know and again it's just acknowledging yeah feeling can be hard right you might notice something feel really uncomfortable um there's no way around it but the more you get used to just first acknowledging so for example i think early on i i, I gave the the story of the guy who didn't even know he had anxiety until he realized you know my jaw hurts all the time i'm pressing down is just kind of okay let's let's kind of focus on the jaw what do you think the jaw is trying to say what could be going on it's just first sometimes you might have to focus on your body then you can kind of understand oh i seem to only have the stomach ache when i'm talking to my boss hmm what's happening there and sometimes by just acknowledging what's there kind of being curious about it this is not an interrogation you're not judging but just being curious why could my stomach be clenching to use the body as an example oh my boss what's going on with your boss i feel really disrespected he talks down to me huh that doesn't feel good so kind of acknowledging letting yourself feel that and just realize you're not crazy for feeling that so th th i think sometimes people have these extreme fears of their feelings because one they think it means something about them that they're crazy or or that it's going to be impossible to deal with and both of those are not true but first you have to practice and just sort of feeling and acknowledging and allowing it to sort of ride the wave and then you'll see it's not an impossible feeling it might feel terrible for a little while but it does end but you're never going to know that if you try and shut it down all the time it's going to make it feel bigger and scarier thank you i needed that <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> awesome i th i think we covered a ton of things is there anything yeah. else that you'd like to highlight for this podcast episode no i think this is great what you're doing i had a lot of fun i, I hope your listeners find this helpful Yeah, for sure. Thank you for taking the time and providing such wonderful insights. Thank yeah, you. I'm pretty sure at least me, my friends and a lot of listeners in tech are going to relate to a lot of these things and appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.